Awesome. Well, welcome to Basecamp. Uh, I'm excited to have today Scott Barry Kaufman join us. Um, Scott is a humanistic psychologist. He's taught at Columbia, University of Pennsylvania, uh, NYU, studied at Yale and Cambridge. He's the host of the Psychology Podcast. It has over 10 million downloads. And he's the best, he's a best-selling author, most recently of a a book called Transcend the New Science of Self-Actualization. Um, I was just talking with Scott before um, before uh, we came and I was telling him how intimidated I was to have him on today and have this conversation because um, self-actualization and transcendence is a, is a very, very big topic. Uh, but I think Scott does a magnificent job of making it not only um, accessible, but actionable and, and, and paints a compelling case why this is something that we should all pay attention to and, and work on. So Scott, uh, welcome to Basecamp. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I now am able to unmute myself. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it is. It's so great to be here. And uh, I, I, I think I'm like the least intimidating person <laughs> you, you, you probably have ever talked to. So um, no worries. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll go, we'll go from that. Um, so I, uh, you know, maybe just to start the conversation and um, to set the stage a little bit, could you tell us who Abraham Maslow was and um, why you first got interested in him and his work in the first place? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Abraham Maslow is a humanistic psychologist who uh, pretty much founded the humanistic psychology movement uh, that was really big for a period of time in the 50s and 60s. Um, I first came across his work seriously when I was teaching uh, at University of Pennsylvania, I was teaching Introductory to Positive Psychology. I was teaching Angela Duckworth's course while she was working on her book, Grit. And as I was preparing my slides for uh, the sort of origins of the field, I came across the field of humanistic psychology, which I had not been that familiar with. And it just blew my mind, the sort of language that they were using and the, the sort of uh, the idea, the notion of self-actualization is such a central uh, goal in life, as opposed to uh, lots of other th words that were being thrown around, uh, like success and achievement and happiness. I, it just really resonated with with my soul in a, in a really really deep way that um, uh, lots of other things didn't you know, weren't resonating with me as much, um, and uh, of course uh, that led me to the ranks of Maslow and the notion of humanistic psychology as being interested in the whole person and being really interested in what does it mean to just be experientially alive and to feel like you're operating in all cylinders and that you're a whole, I, it keeps going back to that whole person model. What does it mean to be integrated? What does it mean to um, feel a great harmony with your, within yourself and, and harmony with the world at large? Wow. Wow. I, um, I read something that, that you had discovered in the, in the process of researching your book, you'd gone through basically all of Maslow's writings and transcripts and personal journals. And there was something in there that I think was from a, a draft of a, his final book, which was ultimately unfinished. And he said something that to the effect of humans have a higher nature, saints, sages, and heroes alike are reflections, not of something superhuman or supernatural, but rather of the capacity to transcend that resides in all of us. Um, and I thought that was really cool because it, it, it makes this something that seems so lofty and aspirational and, and out of reach for most of us. Actually, Maslow's argument is that this capacity to do this resides in all of us. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that and maybe even what does it mean to transcend? Cool. These are big questions, my friend. These are big questions. I'm jumping right in the deep end. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll dial it. We'll we'll go back. We'll go back in a second. But I like to go deep, and then we'll zoom out, and then and then we'll zoom back in. <laughs> so the first the, for the first one, what's really what what I really think is cool about the way Maslow was thinking was. Um, there were a lot of people in, you know, who were in the spiritual world. There were a lot of hippies in the '60s, you know, like Woodstock. They you have to put places within the context of that time period where uh, there was a human potential movement like Esalen Institute, and uh, and a lot of people were just uh, you know just like writing off the hippies is like oh that's hippy dippy stuff is within the field of psychology. The field of psychology was focused very much on Freudian ideas um, that all of our aggressive and destructive impulses are, are the um, uh, you know at, at the base of human nature are sexual and destructive impulses, and that's it. You know that was Freud's view, and then you had behavioralism was big at that time, which was stimulus response 
distance learning. So um, we're, we're just totally influenced by the environment and there's nothing uh, cognitive or worthy of appreciation among humans. Like we just make decisions based on input output. So this was actually revolutionary for Maslow to be like, no, I actually think that uh, there's some good in humans and that it stems from something innate within humans. So both of those things were pretty big notions. So that's what he was getting at with that kind of quote was that, you know, we don't have to, uh, now we have a psychology of, of spirituality. We have a psychology of the higher, uh, the higher reaches of human nature that we can study scientifically. And that is really a part of our evolutionary heritage. It's really uh, just as real as our sexual and destructive impulses and aggressive impulses. Just as real is our altruistic impulses, just as real as our need for self-actualization. So for him to come along and say that was quite revolutionary in the field of psychology. Wow. And so he comes along and he says that that we actually have a better nature inside of us and we can research this, we can study this, and in, in doing so, we can actually um, create some very clear frameworks and practices for how we can unlock that better nature and one of the one of the things that maybe Maslow's most famous for, and we're probably all familiar with it, is Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, his, his pyramid. But I come to find out in, in reading your book that the pyramid never actually existed. Could you could you maybe share a little bit about what that pyramid is and, and why it never actually existed? Well, Maslow never created it. Um, the Maslow existed in textbooks and things written by. That was the visualization of the textbook writers and trying to. Um, uh, visualize this theory. Actually, before the pyramid, it really, there was a, the first iteration version of it. We were able to trace this and other researchers were able to trace this. Uh, one of the first published versions of his theory was a stepladder um, with the different needs. And then at the top, at the top of the stepladder was like the self-realized man with the uh, with a flagpole in the sand sort of thing. And that was in an industrial organization, uh, an organizational psychology textbook or something like that. So it, it, it was that whole like ethos of that time, right. Of like the self-realized man was like the corporate, you know, leader. So it even had like sexist connotations. So Maslow would, would not have been happy to know how his theory was uh, used in that way at all. In fact, I, I, I heard a, um, uh, an example of he was in like a having lunch with someone and he saw the pyramid on the dollar bill, you know, and he's like, oh, I hate that damn pyramid. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we need to set the record straight. He his theory of motivation was really rich, but what really he wanted to emphasize was the fact that humans uh, human development is constantly a two-step forward, one-step back dynamic. We're constantly striving for growth and choosing the growth option, but we're also go right. We can constantly uh, get activated one of our unmet needs and our deprivations. It's not like you know, some uh, like a video game, right, where you reach some level. Um, let's say you you ate, and then you hear some voice from above say, "Congrats, you've now unlocked connection," and then. <laughs> Once you have connection, it's like, no, now you can unlock self-actualization. And then, well, you never have to worry about eating again. I worry about eating five times a day. I don't know about you, but, um, you know, <laughs> that don't go away. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just, I feel like there's total misunderstanding and misappreciation of the fact that he really was a developmental psychologist at heart. Um, as, as am I, you know, um, I'm a humanistic developmental psychologist, right? Uh, I really care a lot about uh, understanding the dynamic nature of humans and how we can be our best selves and strive for higher levels of growth and integration, but integrate the fact that we constantly have our deprivations as well. I mean, it's, it, it never goes away. The, the, the fact that we, that we have deprivations at all times in some area of um, development or growth or security, I think brought me a lot of comfort because I, you, you realize like, okay, there's no, there's no arriving. This is a constant journey and a constant process. And that to your point earlier, of you know, a step forward, a couple steps back or two steps forward, one step back, that seems to be a little bit more approachable and realistic to me. And I think I, <clears throat> I had bought into the, 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 what I guess is an incorrect idea, this kind of pyramid theory where, all right, well, first I've got to meet my, my, you know, physiological needs. I got to meet my safety needs and I kind of level up. And at some point, uh, if you have enough time and attention and resources, then you can be the, you know, the person that's floating off the mountaintop and, uh, and self-actualizing. But what you have 
what you've done in, in researching Maslow's work and then and then put it into, I would say, even evolved and continued what his vision is, you you made it very simple and accessible in the fact that you kind of break it up into these two buckets of first are the security side of things. And the security is uh, really something that is the foundation from which we can grow and explore. And then the other the other half of it is the is the growth side. So maybe we maybe we talk about the security element of uh of this and, and what that what's comprised there and, and and then and then we can discuss the growth side security our security needs are very very important to satisfy to a certain degree so they're not constantly causing um uh, psychic energy in our consciousness so like the need for safety the need for connection the need for self-esteem uh these kind of needs are deprivation needs where we try to uh, when we're deprived of them, we try to get some stasis of them. We try to get them to a certain level where we we feel as though we uh, aren't deprived of we, that, that that deprivation isn't isn't running our life, right? So we have the need for security, or let's say our let's say our safety needs are are woefully absent. Um, you know, we look around and try to find a safe environment. We try to um, we're, we're we're very like sensitive and and uh, aware of our environment and how it's unsafe, and that that really pervades our consciousness. Um, when we are uh, profoundly lonely, we everyone looks as like a potential friend, you know. And uh, paradoxically, that makes us come across as needy and makes people not want to talk to us, um, which is heartbreaking when you think of it. Uh, the, how that cycle works, but the, you know that's the case. And then uh, need for self esteem, people who are extremely uh, lacking. Uh, they don't feel like they matter. They don't feel like they're getting any respect. Well, they start demanding respect, right? Like I demand respect. They, you see, they see others and they see people as vehicles for their own, you know, boost their own respect. But all that is a completely different universe than the growth, you know, the growth realm of human existence. When you can enter the growth realm of human existence and you can help people satisfy their basic needs to a healthy degree, you see that that you see the world in its own terms. You don't see the world just in terms of what's what what someone else is going to do for your own deprivations. You see them as for their own independent, autonomous existence. You have a lot. You have self acceptance. You have self acceptance for yourself. You have that self accept. You have acceptance for others. Um, there's a whole different kind of love, spiritual love that that hap- that unconditional positive regard, as Carl Rogers, the humanistic psychologist, put it. Um, that you start to see um, things are done for the purpose of growth, not for the purpose of satiation. Um, so there, I, I really do think once you once you understand the different realms of human existence like this, you start to understand so much of humanity and um, and so much of what's uh, what maybe is holding us back from seeing the beauty and goodness in others. Yeah, you you talk about this this idea of deficiencies. Um, and that if you could see um, what is driving someone or what they've experienced in the past, uh, what need they're trying to fill, then you would you would absolutely understand why they make the decision they make. What is that thing that is driving that decision? Then where where someone is driven for a need of safety or a need of self esteem or a need of connection um, because they something that they a trauma they experienced in the past or maybe just a a lack of um, access to those things today. You would understand why they're making the decisions that they make, and I, I found that I found that I found that really fascinating. This it's almost having a, a there's a level of empathy that comes from uh, from knowledge and being aware of this model of um, existence. Oh yeah, well you put that very well. I mean, there's having that kind of uh, common humanity and understanding how different environmental triggers um, activate certain basic universal human needs. It really, I think, can give us compassion for others. You know, if you could, you look at people um, in in poverty, people in poor environments, and um, and some people like look down on them as though, you know, are their behaviors like, oh, their behaviors are like the way they are because of their environment, uh, or because of who they are. They're in their environment because of who they are. And I would argue that it's more the environment is helping to shape and bring out. Uh, not the best in, 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 in a lot of people. And, um, and then if you were under very similar situations or conditions, you would probably act very similarly. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're, you would care about, you know, you'd suddenly be put into this uh, uh, state of deprivation. There's some really fascinating studies showing that to be the case. They, they, they took like psychology researchers and they put them in some of these neighborhoods where a lot of people 
um, reported low trust in each other in the in the environment, and uh, uh, they actually gave uh, the researchers um, uh, an escape route. Like if they they were supposed to knock on doors and ask for certain things from people, and they gave them an escape route. Like they're like, well, if you just can't take this environment, you know, you like leave within like five ten minutes. Well, they, they're escaping like quick, quick. Like, they can't handle it. These these upper class uh, psychology students, you know, and it's just like it's just and and also their own. Um, their own scores on trust and distrust even was, you know, budged even within a span of a day, you know? So imagine what it's like to live in such an environment day after day after day. So I, I really do think we need to have more compassion for our fellow humans and, and, and see it from a, from a needs-based perspective. From a, um, from an individual perspective, if I'm looking at myself <clears throat> or I'm sure we have listeners who have um, experienced some form of, trauma or had um, a, a challenging upbringing in their youth. And I think oftentimes we hear, you know, if someone has this experience at a young age, then they're forever altered for that experience. But you talk about this idea that, you know, the the security side of things, whether it's self-esteem connection or safety is actually a summation of all of our experience to date. And so just because, and, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but that the the, the, the theory that childhood um, engagements or interactions don't necessarily set the course for the entire life, that there are, um, there are opportunities to make adjustments down the road. Is that? Yeah, well, I, uh, I would be uh, hypocritical as a humanistic psychologist if I disagreed with that. Um, Karen Horney, uh, one of the original uh, humanistic psychologists, although I don't know if she would think of herself that way. She was, she was a psychoanalytical uh, uh bent and she was the first feminist psychoanalyst to challenge freud she wrote you know we can grow and change until the day we die you know she has a great quote along those lines i think that's like the mantra of the humanistic psychologist so of course you know i think that um i really believe in the potential for growth i believe in people's potential to to choose the growth option um and i think that's what a lot of the stuff comes down to is 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 having the courage to choose that option uh, day in and day out on the on, on I want to I want to make sure I don't leave anything um, unturned here on these on these three aspects of security. There's one point on safety that I that I thought was really interesting. This idea of coherence, and so I just for anyone that um, that is thinking about safety and saying, you know, well, there's only so much that I can control, or you know, maybe I'm just um, I'm, I'm you know I understand what that is, and and I feel like I've got what I need. This idea of coherence and uh, some predictability and, uh, and and ability to exert control. Could you could you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, there's different meanings of the of the word meaning itself. Um, coherence is one form of meaning, and that's do things in your environment uh, make sense? Um, is there any predictability at all? Is there a lot of harshness and uncontrollability? A lot of violence? A lot of um, you know, you don't know when you're going to get your next meal. There's a meal instability. Um, you know, that's that's coherence. And that's a form of meaning. That's a very important form of meaning. It's a different form of meaning than the kind of meaning we talk about when we talk about purpose. You know, what is your purpose in life? You know, which is more of a forward-looking goal that energizes you and uh, and, and and gets you um, uh, revved up, so to speak, yeah, yeah. You know, to, to, to realize a goal. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. There was, there, there was something about this idea of like regaining a sense of coherence um, can be one of the things that are most immensely valuable to those who feel like they, their safety needs are unmet. And so um, I, I thought that that was, that that was really interesting because I never really thought about safety from the standpoint of coherence on connection. You break it out in two parts. One is a, a sense of belonging um, that you have your people and you, the, the um, people that you can depend on and you have um um, that you're almost part of a tribe or you're part of a, a network of people. But then the other part of it was this intimacy. And, and you mentioned this just a little while ago, unconditional positive regard. And the follow on is this, this sense of mutual vulnerability and responsiveness. And that it doesn't have to come from a lot of people, but if you have that with even just a few people, then that can, that can really meet that requirement for, for that connection. It's amazing how few people to have a real genuine healthy connection with that you really need. Uh, we do so many things thinking that it'll satisfy the need for connection. 
when it's not deeply satisfying our need for connection. We think maybe more likes on Facebook or more likes on Instagram will, and then we're, will satisfy. And then we're like confused. We're like, why is, why do I still feel even lonelier than I did before? When all it really takes is like two, three people in your life who are your people, you know, like I hope everyone in this room has like your people, right. That you can go to and complain and, you know, and what, and, and, or have successes and they'll be generally, you know, happy for your successes. And um, it's just, you know, it's uh, so much of the loneliness is uh, of this epidemic or people don't have their people uh, in their life and they're searching for connection in all the wrong places. Wow. Yeah. That's, it's so, it's so powerful to think about that. We need that, but that also that we can give that to others, this, this, almost this sense of vulnerability, but also just that no matter what I got gotcha, you, I'm here for you. And, um, and I believe in you and I'm, I'm connected to you and that um, giving that as well as receiving that um, I'm sure there's some, some, some synergy there and some amplification on the self-esteem side. This is the, really the third component of security. I think this is one where maybe the fixed mindset manifests itself the most that like, man, I've always had this, a low self-esteem. I've always been someone that, you know, has a real high self-esteem, maybe to a fault. Um, could you talk about the, the ability that we have to affect our self-esteem at, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of age and why, and why that, and why that matters? Yeah. Well, so well, there's different shades of self-esteem. There's narcissistic, uh, well, okay, maybe I should back up and say the need for self-esteem can be satisfied in different ways. Um, maybe I should say that, put it that way. Uh, a lot of people try to solve their need for self-esteem through narcissistic roots, thinking that uh, if they only get uh, a constant, constant praise, uh, then then they'll really lick that need, you know, not need it anymore. But has anyone, has that ever happened? Has it, has, has anyone searched for for in that route and have ever felt satisfied? Like, you know, have you ever gotten like a hundred thousand likes on Instagram and then you're like, you know what? I'm I'm satiated. I'm done. You know, tomorrow I'm. Uh, that's all I needed. That's all I needed. No, you want more. <laughs> you want more likes. You want more attention. <laughs> so this stuff is like a monster that eats itself, right? So um uh so there are healthier ways roots of self esteem like authentic mastery. Um, really having a pride in something you put into the world and also feeling a great sense of uh, uh, connection with others and getting your self-esteem through um, helping others and um, being having genuine connections. Um, there, there are healthier roots to self-esteem and then narcissistic roots to self-esteem. And I, I go through all the different forms of narcissism. There are lots of different forms of narcissism, which, are, which I see as all just different attempts at um, reaching homeostasis on the self-esteem need. Mm -hmm. Wow. So in, <clears throat> I have to imagine that in building one's self-esteem, whether you're working on the, um, you know, the true sense of like self-worth that, that you matter and that you're a good person, that you have value to, to give to others and, and serve others, or you're working on the, the agency side that you have something that you've mastered and that you can control that, as long as you know those two directions, whatever step you want to take in those directions can build on it. So it's not something that you have to tackle tomorrow. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna master something tomorrow, and I'm not gonna probably uh, feel that I've I've completely checked the self worth box tomorrow. But you start taking small incremental steps in these areas, and very quickly, I would imagine you can arrive at a place where maybe not arrive, but continue down a path of increasing self esteem that that builds on itself over time. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I like that idea of incremental um, growth of one's self-esteem as opposed to the f flash uh, pan or whatever, the, you know, just like the immediate sort of, um, you know, like getting addicted to the highs because that's what, I think that's what narcissism is. I think it's addiction to uh, self-esteem. Uh, that's literally what I think it is. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the healthy self-esteem is one where you no longer focus on self-esteem. The, the healthy self-esteem is one where that's not a, the, the important overriding concern in your life anymore. It's so interesting. I one one of the, I've, I've shared this before, but I think being a, um, 
going through SEAL training. And if you go through it the right way, then you're constantly focused on your teammates and other people in your boat crew um, as you're going through training. And the, the, the cool thing about that is when you're focused on others, you, you don't feel your pain as much but you're in service to, to someone else and, and you get that reflected back to you and it gives you a greater sense of control of worth. And, and in, in some, some maybe strange way, you kind of back in, into the self-esteem, which improves your agency. And ultimately I think sets you on a good path. And you see alternatively the people that get myopically focused on themselves um, that they end up not being able to continue because they don't think they have the capacity or that they're worthy or capable. So um, I just thought that that just came to me as, as you were describing that. Um, okay. So I, I feel like we have a good, we have a good sense of the, the security side of the equation and, and, and that, that you really, that is the platform from which you can step into and grow. And um, on the opposite side of deficiency is, is being uh, as, as you frame it. And so the, on this, on this side, on the growth side, there were really three areas that you, that you laid out exploration, love, and purpose. Maybe we could start with exploration and, and, and dive into that a little bit. What's going on when we talk about ex exploration and growth and why is that important to our, um, to our overall health? Well, the need for exploration, I think, is a fundamental human need as well. The need for varied experiences that are challenging, that um, that they get us, that are complex, that, that allow us to grow and uh, get outside our comfort zone and explore new things. Uh, there are many, many different kind of outlets for the need for exploration. And I think that that need is one of the most foundational aspects of creativity. Uh, and uh, in a lot of ways, self-actualization and Creative creativity are synonymous in my head. Um, what you're doing when you're self act someone in the actual uh, Renee, in fact, uh, Renee said, "I feel like self actualization is used a lot. Could you define what it actually means?" And yeah, and that's uh, I think that it's the, the creativity. It's like, are you realizing the potentialities within yourself that are uniquely yours um, that that you can really uh, in a, in in a way in a big way uh, bring into existence. Uh, it's not, it's different clearly than your, your lower needs, which we share with others. Um, we all have the need for respect. We all have the need for connection and safety. It doesn't make you particularly special to have those needs, but if you can play a violin concerto, like no one else can, or you can, you know, whatever your unique creative potential is, then, then we're, now we're in a different realm where it's something only uniquely you. The, um, you talk about well, one, I'm never going to be able to play a violin concerto, so I hope that's not the the metric of success here. But uh, the the you you raise an interesting point in that there's this almost tension between conviction and openness when it comes to exploration. You have to have conviction that what I know I know, and that affords me the opportunity to go forth and explore. But you have to be open to novel experiences, novel. Um, interpretations or um, information coming in. Could you talk a little bit about that and and what's going on when um, if you can hold both of those at the same time? I'm sorry. What are the two things I'm holding at the same time? The, this idea of of conviction and openness simultaneously, as it relates to exploration. And if that doesn't ring any if that doesn't ring any bells, we hit the next button. It's, it's something I came across in the book. This idea that. Um, to truly explore, you have to have some um, some conviction in what you know uh, and feel very confident in what you know so that you can go forth and, and almost leave home base and go out and experience other things. But at the same time that you know these things, you're open to novel and new experiences. I don't recall mentioning that in the book, but I like that idea. <laughs> sounds, good. Right. sounds good to me i mean you need a certain confidence in what you know or else you would never act in the world you would not move you would constantly be at the whims of uh of everything entering your senses but at the same time being able to explore and have social curiosity is super important i think that might maybe you're referring to something within the social curiosity um level uh, or section of, of it, where we can be very curious about people who might have different knowledge from ourselves so that we can integrate that with our own knowledge base and learn and grow our own knowledge base. Um, unfortunately, these days we have conversations that are already preset, like that, you know, I don't want to talk to you, you know, like, or like, there's nothing I can learn from you, or um, there's just there's such a profound lack of social curiosity these days. If you 
tag someone as being in your out group, for instance, or someone who's you just you you perceive them to not even be worth it. Um, and uh, that's like that's like confidence in one's knowledge and worldview without the openness to experience. So I think Got both it. both are good in combination. Amazing. The, um, there was something that Todd uh, Kashton um, said in the in the book. This um, this point that that he uncovered that the need for exploration um, had very strong correlation with stress tolerance and demonstrated the strongest correlation with these many dimensions of well being. And so, if you and maybe the takeaway, at least my takeaway from that is that um, if I find that. I'm getting fixed and rigid and and not learning new things or seeking new opportunities to kind of open my aperture and expand, then I might be missing out on um on this exploration element and all of the downstream effects that come from exploring as it as it relates to well-being and um so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So um awesome. Okay. All right. So exploration we got. Let's shift to love. Uh, Kristen's my brother, man. Brother I, man. Uh, I, he's great. We should give a big shout out to him and his work on curiosity. Amazing. Amazing. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll check them out. Maybe we'll, we'll get them on a, a future one. Um, so we shifting to, to love in this, in this next, um, not love level, but this, this next component of growth, you said that love was the thing that was most strongly correlated to growth. Um, maybe let's, let's dive in on love and what's going on there. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, how strongly correlated that love is with so many different, aspects of well-being and growth and and being a human um well I, I, i'm trying to figure out a good way of, in way to this because i initiated a research program recently on the light triad which is the opposite of um of the the, the triad of uh, of traits like machiavellianism narcissism and psychopathy right um that's been called the dark triad and the light triad is believing in the fundamental goodness of others, um, not using people as a means to an end, but actually as admiring people on their own for who they are, not know what you need to get from them. And also um, having a faith in humanity. And we have found that this light triad of personality characteristics, I really pro really do a nice job of, uh, um, of, of matching what Maslow referred to as be love or what having love for the being of others. Um, and, uh, and, and we have found in our research that be love or, you know, these light triad characteristics are correlated with growth so strongly and correlated with, well, the drive for growth correlated with life satisfaction, happiness. Um, you know, we have found in our research that well, assholes really aren't that happy. You know, like they're, they're really not, it doesn't, doesn't pay to really to be an asshole. It really just doesn't pay. Uh, even, even if you're an asshole and you want to, you know, you only, you're selfish and you only want things that pay. Well, I would make the case that it well, was that working out for you, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, like uh, being able to cultivate more of this kind of higher level spiritual form of be love is very important. And I make a very clear distinction in my book between uh, be love and the need for connection, which I see as a lower need. Uh, we usually with the need for connection, we only feel connected to people we like and uh, and uh, that we feel some sort of oxytocin connection with, or, you know, that they, oh, we share the same political beliefs. You're my new best friend, you know, um, but be love is, is this radical notion. I mean, totally radical that you can love someone you don't like. I mean, that's like unheard of in society today that such a thing is even possible. What, what does that even mean to love? Someone give, like? Well, love is not, is an adverb in this case. It's not a, it's not a feel, it's not an emotion. It's an adverb. Okay. Uh, it's an action verb to love. You can give love to someone you don't like. Right, you can um, you can still care for their well being, and you still care loving kindness, care for the reduced re reduction of their suffering. Prob chances are they're suffering, right? Just as you are. Uh, the Buddha <laughs> said it better than better than me. We're all suffering. If you think you're the only one on this planet who isn't suffering, you're suffering. <laughs> so, um, you know, being able to really look at a fellow human. Um, that maybe even repulses you, you know, or someone that like their ideology, their ideas are completely different than yours. And to be able to still wish um, the best for them and to still 
um, do uh, still give do actions that that signal um, uh, that that wish is is a, is a, it's a, it takes a lot of inhibiting of a lot of of our lower nature. But I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the heart. I'm sorry. I apologize. Could continue. No, I was on a roll. Yeah, but, I know. Continue. Uh, Keep firing. <laughs> no, now I'm done. Now I'm done. It was just I was like getting emotional. Um, you know, I'm I'm assuming that the harder you have to work um, to love someone, maybe that you don't like or that you're not connected to or that um, uh, has wronged you in some way, the harder you have to work, maybe the more benefit there is into finding a way to love that person. So this yeah. idea, again, that the, the struggle to love is actually um, part of the journey that delivers the most rewards. Um, I love but, that. Okay. Cool. I love that. I, I, Some people you might want to love from a distance, though. Let's be honest. <laughs> for sure, but but you 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 talk about this idea of, of it's not it's almost having this orientation towards love, and that it's it, it becomes a almost a default way of being and, and moving through the world and how you treat others, and that's where the the greatest value gets gets unlocked there, which I think is is a really powerful way of framing it. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, okay, so I think oh, so we understand love and. The final one in this in this growth phase is, is purpose, um, and you had this this great line from Maslow who says that the those that he's always found to be most self actualized pursued their calling, not happiness. Which the first time I read that, I was like, wait a second, what's going on here? I thought happiness was the goal, but um, that's not actually what's going on. So maybe could you explain what is happening here when we're talking about purpose, and maybe what did Maslow mean by that? Well, happiness is uh, something that can be quite fleeting. It can be an uh, emotion that you have that some days, some moments you feel happy. And then the very next moment you're like, wow, I'm now unhappy. <laughs> but that, that was fast. <laughs> you know? hmm. That lasted about five, five seconds. I was happy. Um, I, but, you know, call, having a calling is something much more enduring and something much more meaningful in the long run. Having some... Uh, something from outside of yourself that you feel is calling you to help address a need outside of yourself is something that can bring us such a deep, deep sense of satisfaction um, that, that happiness uh, often can't bring us. Got it. Got it. And in, in this, whether it's a calling or a purpose, the way that you laid it out is that the ones that are most conducive to growth um, mastery, self-improvement, creativity, connection, something that contributes to society, uh, those all lead to greater well-being. But when those, when your goal or your, um, your purpose is driven by insecurity, whether it's going after power or money or self-esteem or status, that that actually has the opposite effect that you're intending. So we probably all know someone that you know worked really hard to achieve a certain title or make a certain amount of money, but found there that once they achieved that, they were actually it was an empty goal from the start. Um, so, I, I don't as is, is, is in your work and your in your research, is, is there anything else that you might add to that point that would help someone that is um, trying to figure out well how do I find my calling or how do I find my purpose? Yeah, I don't think it's good to think of it that you have some predestined singular purpose that you just need to discover that one thing. Think that there are so many callings all around us. Um, so many ways we can jump in and immediately help, you know, it's not like, uh, you have some starving kid in front of you and they're like, Hey, can I have some change? And you're like, I have the money, but I'm not going to give it to you. Cause that's not my one calling. You know, it's like, what? Like, help the kid. <laughs> like, you know, I just, I feel like that could be your calling in your mo in that moment. That's your calling. This person's calling you to help them. So I just think we need to really think about this differently. Um, and, and people put so much pressure on themselves to like find the one true purpose. Um, when, um, you know, just roll up your sleeves and get to work. And, and does, does the purpose have to be a profession or can the profession run in parallel to the purpose? Can your purpose, be to exist in a certain way in the world and interact with others in a certain way um, that plays out through your profession? Or do you find that oftentimes these are one and the same? It depends. Like, are you doing your job? Like sometimes people need money. 
right? To be able to do their purpose all so the time. <laughs> people, you know, some people have their job and then they, what that, and that's not their purpose, but then they have enough money to sustain themselves to do the, I mean, you think of all the, I live in LA right now. Think of all the waiters that are aspiring actors. You know, it's not like they're like waiting is my purpose, you know, acting is, but their job is waiting tables right now. So I think that um, ideally your work life, your uh, it would be so well integrated into the rest of you that uh, you, you can't really differentiate uh, the difference between these things. Actually, I talk about synergy, which is a phrase that Maslow really loved. Um, and that's when yourself is so well integrated into the world that what you love to do automatically is good for you and good for the world. Um, there's no separation between self and world. I actually see that as transcendence. I know you're going to get there in a second, but that's a spo- spoiler alert. It's the it's next up on the list. Before we get before we get to transcendence, uh, you you had one other aspect of purpose that I thought was something interesting that I hadn't really thought of before. It's this idea that it's really important to have a very clear image of your possible self. Um, I'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, visual visualization techniques are super important. Being able to clarify and understand what port you're sailing to. You know, in my sailboat model model. Um, did, did, did we even mention the fact that my revised hierarchy of needs is a sailboat? I didn't cause I am terrible at drawing. And I didn't know if I could get the sailboat, but we, we are now, so let's talk about it. <laughs> well, you have the boat itself, which represents safety. Um, and, uh, and if you have too many holes in the boat, you're going to sink, right? So you do need your, some basic needs, um, to a certain level. So you don't sink. And so you feel like you're sta- standing on a safe foundation, but eventually even if you just have a stable boat, you're not going to move anywhere unless you open up your sail and you need to open up that sail and, um, and move towards and know what port are you sailing to? That's what I'm, that's what I mean by getting clear with your visualization of who do you want to become and knowing that there's going to be lots of unknowns along the way, the sea can have things, waves and the winds and things that are just at any moment could come crashing down on us but we still have to choose that growth option and move towards the port that we want to sail to or else what's the point? That makes a, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. When, when I, when I read that too, it, it, something that struck me was this, uh, the possible self may never come to fruition, but it can be the thing that we strive towards and work towards. And that striving and that working towards something that inspires us or motivates us um, that is the journey that is rewarding, uh, which, which I thought was, I thought it was pretty cool. So, um, okay. All right. So we, we've covered the boat. We talked about the, the hull of the boat, which is this, these security um, needs of safety, connection, self-esteem. And that uh, if we don't have those met, that we're driven by deficiency and we have to constantly plug those hole in the boat and we're, we're driven um, uh, maybe not unlocking our full potential or we're tapping into a, a lower aspect of our nature, the deficiency side. On the sales side of the boat is exploration, love, and purpose. And this is really about growth and opportunity and existing in a state of, of being um, that uh, puts us in a place where we are capable of uh, arriving to this place, um, not staying there, but at least arriving there and touching it, which is transcendence. So what is transcendence and why is it something that we uh, we would like to access? I believe in a, a horizontal form of transcendence more than a vertical form of transcendence, vertical transcendence is like, I'm enlightened and you're not, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, took, I took a couple yoga classes and now I'm better than you, you know, like (laughs) I can do the downward facing (laughs) dog, you know, so therefore I'm enlightened, you know, whereas, you know, like, I think that a horizontal transcendence is, is more about how, how much are we harmonious with our environment, you know, and how, how much is our, own inner nature, um, our inner, have we done the inner work, you know, where we feel like a whole person or are we constantly projecting all of our own insecurities and deprivations onto the world? And, um, uh, to me, transcendence is about oneness, not about being above others. And is transcendence in the simplest of languages is what we might define if we look back in our lives, if we've ever had these moments is like, perfect experiences. Like we would say that is perfection. Maybe it was, you know, with family or 
vacation or working on something that I was really fired up about, but it's almost this in this state of working or having this perfect experience, you lose a sense of self that the, the walls drop between self and others. And, and then that is that, that is that oh, state. Yeah. Is that. Oh, hell yeah. It's like, I mean, you know, I'm not one to ask if you've ever done any of the magic mushrooms, but um, <laughs> some people can induce the state, you know, with, with pharmaceutical, not pharmaceuticals, but with a, uh, what psychedelics is what I'm trying to say psychedelics, but we can all work towards it. I think we also can induce the state without psychedelics. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there are a lot of spiritual practices that one could have and a lot of uh, mindful practices and, um, and ways of being in the world where they f- you have this amazing flow state or a uh, peak experience, you know, just staring at a sun set can be a peak experience. Uh, a lot of women report childbirth to them as a peak experience. You know, there's, there are these moments in our lives. My wife would not say that. <laughs> oh yeah. A lot of people maybe wouldn't, wouldn't say that, but some would. Um, yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, there's just a lot of things that the things we would least expect, you know, can, can call can cause us to have this peak experience where we just suddenly feel such a sense of love and connection and oneness with others. Um, you know, you raise the, the mushrooms or, or maybe other things that people um, take to achieve a sense of um, peak experience. But I, you, you put a great quote in by Maslow in the book where Maslow said uh, that he believed an unearned paradise becomes worthless. Mm-hmm. So maybe you can, and Andrew would say, you know, those things are trampolines that are not stairs where you can hop up and see something, you come back down and then uh, it's hard to integrate or see what the, the long-term benefits of that are. But that, um, and what I thought you put so eloquently in the book is this idea of if you can integrate the whole self, um, both the security side and the growth side, then you are, you're almost having a, um, I think you called it a, a healthy transcendence where you're sitting on a plateau and you have more opportunities more often to achieve this state, not by something outside yourself, but because it's coming from within, um, which I thought was, was really, really, really cool and made, uh, made it very clear why it's important to, to do this work and to, to go down this path. Well, thank you. Uh, the plateau experience was a very transcendent experience that Maslow noticed only after he had a sudden death, an almost death experience. Um, and, uh, and he, he, he said he was living a post, a post-mortem life the last couple years of his life. He felt like everyone should die and then be able to come back and live this post-mortem life. He said everything was brighter. Everything was more beautiful. Everything, every moment was more precious. He called this the uh, the plateau experience, not not so much about the peaks, but about the, about the lounging in heaven, not getting so excited about it is what he said. Uh, being able to have more of the plateau, seeing the miraculous in the everyday is what he said is, is, is the plateau experience. But I want to tell you just a little funny story about uh, Maslow's notions of, um, of you should work for it. He has this, uh, when it comes to psychedelics, he was anti-psychedelics. He, uh, he would get letters. I read the letters. I, I was at the archives many, many hours and read lots of letters of people that sent the letters to Maslow and people like Maslow, uh, I want to do psychedelics. Should I do it? And he'd be like, um, well, would you take an elevator to the top of Mount Everest? You know, so that's how he responded to these people. <laughs> now, so here's the thing. Him and Timothy Leary, they had a very uh, joking relationship about this. Timothy Leary, as many people might not know, was a Harvard professor who was a big, big uh, into psychedelics. Um, uh, tune in, drop out or whatever the expression is. Um, I don't know if it, does anyone in this room know what Timothy Leary is. Okay, we see Jennifer nodding her head. <laughs> um, yeah, and so one day Maslow and Timothy Leary were walking on Harvard's campus, um, and they, they they had such a they're engrossed in their conversation so much, um, they they went pretty far far out from where they usually are, um, and uh, and, uh, and and Timothy Leary is like, uh, should we order a taxi or did you want to just walk back, Maslow? <laughs> that was a, a dig. That was a dig. You know, um, sometimes taking the taxi is the enjoyable, be- better option in life. You get you, you, you get Timothy Leary's joke there. Yeah, <laughs> this, this, apparently this conversation really happened. Yeah. Oh my god, that that that's pretty funny. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. Um, all right, very 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 cool. So, um, you end the book by talking about uh, healthy transcendence and that. Healthy transcendence, again, is not 
much like um, our, our, the image of our possible self. It's not something that is necessarily ever achieved, but it's a, almost a North Star to live by. Could you, could you maybe um, expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I don't think we should view transcendence or even self-actualization as a destination, but view it as a direction. You know, what is the direction we're moving in in our lives day after day? Uh, do the thought experiment. I, I, I do. A, I created a new form of coaching. I call self actualization coaching, and a big part of it is is encouraging clients to think through. Um, okay, where is that series of decisions you're making in your life? Where's that leading? <laughs> think that through before you get there. <laughs> you know, like I make certain decisions. I'm like, okay, I do love pizza. You know, I eat pizza a lot. You know, but too much of it. Where's that going to take me? I'm going to be a blimp, you know? So like, you know, I just try to think of lots of different things in my life. Where's that going to take me? Where's the, where's the ultimate going to take me, you know? Um, And choosing that growth option is so, so, so important. Choosing that option day after day after day, being able to really move in the direction of where, who you most want to become. You know, who is that person you most want to become in your life and make those choices that will really help get you there. I mean, I, I think we can do it. I really believe in people's potential for growth. I really believe in it. I think that's a foundation of, of this kind of coaching program is being a coach in saying that you believe that they are capable of making the choices that are going to be best for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you think about self-actualization or, or even transcendence, maybe, maybe more applied to self-actualization how much of it is um, almost contem- contemplative where you're focusing on what you already have and being grateful for ver- versus, you know, um, the other side of it may be more of the goal pursuit side and, and the growth versus the savoring, I guess, is maybe the, the two extremes or is it, is it yes and? Well, it's definitely yes and. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because there's a, uh... There, there, there are those who are like, uh, they're obsessed with goals, right? They're obsessed with it. Uh, Andrew Huberman, Andrew, Huber, our mutual friend, Andrew Huberman, he <laughs> loves, he's obsessed with goals. Let's be honest. Like every day of his life is like this, this, this is like whoa. <laughs> <sighs> being, being is good sometimes, right? Like, like sometimes it's important to um, uh, just explore without there being any potential for biohacking yourself, right? Like without there being any potential at all. And, you know, and I say this with all like deep love and respect for people in the biohacking community. I'm not, no shade. There's no shade at all. I, deep respect. But I think that equally, uh, I think it's possible to get so caught up in that world that you miss out on the beauty of the unexpected. You miss out on the beauty of the human, um, the person in front of you. I, I jokingly said once, and it got a lot of people in the biohacking community pissed off at me. I said, you can't biohack your way yourself to connection. <laughs> you can't. Act- it, it, a, a real genuine human connection. You can't pop a supplement for that. <laughs> you know, so there are certain things in life, you know, that like we can do and habits we can get into that can really help us um, really be as present as possible to whatever is unfolding and be open to whatever unfolds. Mm -hmm. And I think balancing that in your life is good. Don't get me wrong. I think goals are very important too. Very important. Um, But being able to balance um, those things and and, and not blinding yourself from the potential and expected beauty is just as important. What do you think? uh, What do you think? Did I, uh, did I piss you off? <laughs> no, no, I, I, I well, I, well, first, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I would not put myself in the, in the biohacking crowd. So, I, no offense, um, no offense here, no, no offense taken. Um, I think that, uh, I think it makes a ton of sense. Look, as someone that, you know, is, I find myself being driven by goals oftentimes, and whether it is in the military, outside of the military, but um, that's probably something that I have to. Um, check in with myself in from time to time of, am I always focused on the next thing? Am I actually taking time to sit and savor and experience and, um, and, uh, and connect and both with myself and with those around me. And I think that's, it's such an important point that you make. And, um, and I think the question you have to ask yourself is what is it that I'm optimizing towards maybe towards your, towards your question of well, where is that decision going to lead? Like, if I'm constantly optimizing and then I kind of lose sight of what's the the biggest thing that I could optimize around, then um, 
then you might find yourself getting into a place that you don't want to be. So, um, and, uh, and what, uh, why does one need to optimize uh, all the time? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Uh, is it ever okay to just allow yourself to, to exist and to feel, feel what it means to exist, to feel what it means to be an unoptimized human, to even love your unoptimized self, to even accept it. What would it mean to accept it? You know, and that you have parts of yourself that will never be optimized. And then can you still love it? I, I just have lots of questions for people who are obsessed with optimizing every single second of their life. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a, it's, it's an important question. And, um, and I, I agree with you there that um, you've got to, uh, you got to take time to simply be. And I think you make such a compelling uh, case, both in this book and in, in, in your work of, of how we can do that. And I think what, what's so cool about what you've taken us through and what you, you've written about is one, we can understand this framework of, all right, we're, are we being driven by security and deficiency? Um, are we driven by growth and being and um, understanding our, our safety needs met or our connection needs met? Is our self-esteem intact? And if so, are we taking the full opportunities that we can to enter into this growth and exploration phase and, and to be the source of love that we want to be and to have a purpose or have a higher calling that is in service to something greater than to ourselves. And if we can do this and recognize that we're never going to arrive, that we're constantly going to have deficits and we're constantly going to have opportunities. But if we can engage this model, then um, more times than, um, then we're going to more and more often, we're going to experience these moments of transcendence. And, um, and that can be a very positive and what Maslow might say, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, but, uh, the, uh, a great state of being of, of constantly striving and dipping in and out of that, that place. And, um, I'm going to, I'm going to pass it over to you. I know, know we're almost up on time. I'm going to say one quote that I thought was especially profound, and I'm going to pass it over to you for any final takeaways or thoughts that you want to share. But and this is coming out of the plateau experiences that that Maslow said, but he said that the greatest lesson from the true mystics is that the sacred is in the ordinary, that it is to be found in one's daily life, in one's neighbors, friends, and family, and in one's backyard. And um, I think that's pretty powerful. So Scott, thank you so much for being here. Over to you for a uh, final comment, words of wisdom. It was a real honor for me to talk to you. I really do uh, admire your way of being. Um, you, you even your cadences, and I can tell that you're a, you're a good guy. So um, I can tell these things. <laughs> so I'm saying this is what I see in you. You're a real good guy, and uh, it's it's been a real honor talking to you today. And yeah, I just wish everyone really all the best uh, in your self actualization journey. I'm rooting for everyone. Like I feel like that's that my purpose or my calling is just to like let people know I believe in them. You know, I believe Amazing. in the potential for growth. Amazing. Amazing. Scott, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for sharing. And uh, thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much for making time on a uh, Thursday. No, yeah, Wednesday. Seriously. What is it? Thursday, Thursday afternoon. Uh, wish everyone the best and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Cheers. Bye.